Kuala Kang Sa is the royal town of the state of Perak, reigned at different intervals by the Perak rulers since 1549 at Kota Lama Kanan, Sayong and Bukit Chandan. Located at the confluence of the Perak River and its Kang Sa tributary, it is understood to have taken after the name of the Kang Sa flower, Hibiscus flocosus, which grew abundantly along the banks of the Kang Sa River. Oral history passed down to the locals, however, notes the original name to be Kuala Kurang Sa, interpreted as the 99 small tributary flow into the Perak River. Kuala Kang Sa is well known not only for its royal and historical associations, but also for its picturesque beauty, rich cultural heritage, and historical landmarks, which are ever more appealing to tourists. Tapi pada pandangan Pak Cik lah, Pak Cik rasa sengah perak ni tak kala dulu tak dicema, air dia jernih. Hmm. Kan? Bila naik bukit tinggi kita nampak silau tu, dia katakan berupa perak tu. Ha, itu sebutan yang boleh diterima pakai lah, logik dia. Kalau nak katakan perak, mana lombong perak kan? Yang tu mobil timah yang ada. Kuala Kansar, eh. Kuala Kansar ni ialah sebuah bandar yang eh, lokasinya terletak lebih kurang 48 km ke utara Ipoh. Ditabalkan ataupun di, di popular dengan nama sebagai bandar diraja lah. Eh, bandar diraja negeri Perak sebab di sinilah bersemayamnya eh, Sultan-Sultan Perak eh, eh, dan istana eh, Sultan Perak juga terletak di sini. Eh. Kebanyakan istana-istana daripada dulu sehingga sekarang. Uh, uh, semenjak akhir-akhir selepas pos mereka ini uh, terutamanya uh, terletak di Kuala Kangsar eh. jadi setahu saya Kuala Kangsar ini sebuah kawasan yang amat cantik dan menarik lah. Malay Royal Towns or Bandar Diraja are the seat of administration of the Malay rulers. Such towns are historically and culturally significant in displaying the hierarchy of the Malay Sultanate, which dates to the 16th century. The characteristics of royal towns in Malaysia differ from the districts that are designated as state capitals. Some examples of Bandar Diraja in other states include Bandar Diraja Arau, Perlis Indera Kayangan Bandar Diraja Kelang, Selangor Darul Esan Bandar Diraja Seri Menanti, Negeri Sembilan Darul Khusus Bandar Diraja Pekan, Pahang Darul Makmur Bandar Diraja Anak Bukit, Alusta Kedah Darul Aman Bandar Diraja Mua, Johor Darul Takzim. Bandar Diraja Kuala Terengganu, Terengganu Darul Iman. Bandar Diraja Kubang Kerian, Kota Baru, Kelantan Darul Naib. A Malaysian royal town can be defined by eight unique characteristics. Palace complex, a royal mosque, royal town square, also known as Dataran Diraja, a protocol road, 
a Royal River Jetty, Business Enclave, Residential Enclaves, Heritage Sites. These eight characteristics are essential in forming the overall perception of what makes a royal town. As the official residence of the Sultan or ruler, the palace complex forms an integral character of a royal town. Pembinaan istana ni adalah tempat di mana Sultan-Sultan Perak bersemayam lah. Jadi uh, sehingga kepada abad ke-19 dan 20, uh, kita dapati bahawa Sultan-Sultan Perak yang uh, memerintah uh, negeri Perak ketika itu, mula uh, membina uh, istana-istana di Kuala Kansai. Eh. Jadi kalau kita sebelum daripada istana Kenangan dan juga istana Iskandariah itu, ada lagi beberapa istana lain yang terdapat di sekitar uh, Kuala Kansai. Lah. Kuala Kansai's earliest palace complexes such as the Istana Sri Sayong are long gone. The oldest palace structure that is still standing is the Istana Ulu or Istana Kota located on the western bank of the Perak River. Built in 1898 during the reign of Sultan Idris Murshidul Azam Shah, this today known as Sultan Azlan Shah Gallery. Istana Kenangan, also known as Istana Lembah, is an exceptional example of Perak's Malay architecture and craftsmanship. This palace served as a temporary residence for Sultan Iskandar Shah and Raja Perempuan Kelso before moving into Istana Iskandaria. Istana Kenangan ni adalah istana yang sekarang ni telah dijadikan sebagai muzium. Okey. Dia itu adalah kau istana sementara. Okey, semasa pembinaan istana negara ataupun istana Iskandariah. Okey, selepas istana Iskandariah siap, okey, sultan berpindah ke istana Iskandariah dan kawasan istana Kenangan selepas itu dijadikan fungsi yang lain dan sekarang ini dijadikan sebagai uh, muzium ataupun galeri diraja di Kuala Kansai. Istana Kedangan ni dia arkitektur dia dia menggunakan arkitektur setempat. Benda kulit arkitektur. Okey. Sebab tu kita tengok dari segi dia punya susunan pattern corak di dinding, susun susun atur ruang, bumbung, bahan-bahan pembinaan yang digunakan. Okey, semua ni menggunakan konsep pembinaan yang terdapat di kawasan setempat. Istana Kenangan atau juga dipanggil sebagai nama lainnya ada dipanggil sebagai Istana Lembah ada yang dipanggil sebagai Istana Tepas ada yang dipanggil sebagai Istana Kuning ada banyak nama yang dipopular lah jadi dia sebenarnya ialah sebuah istana yang dibina sementara sementara bangunan Istana Iskandaria itu sedang dibina jadi Sultan tempat bersemayam secara rasmi bagi the Sultan tinggal di situ, bersemayam di situ uh, hampir 2 tahun juga ya, sementara menunggu uh, Istana Iskandaria itu siap ya. Bumbung pula Istana Negara Istana Kenangan ini menggunakan kayu belian. Kayu belian ni kayu yang cukup mahal. Dia boleh tahan sampai beratus tahun tak, tanpa di gugat oleh apa ni cuaca
Istana Iskandaria, built on the site of the Istana Negara in 1933, is a three-story palace building located on the hilltop of Bukit Chandan, overlooking the tranquil Pera River. Okay, tentang Istana Iskandaria yang letak di Bukit Chandan itu yang itu adalah uh, merupakan uh, tapak asal kepada Istana Negara uh, kemudian dia ambil alih uh, dibina pelak Istana Iskandaria eh, nama Istana Iskandaria, Iskandaria itu dia ambil sepena Sultan yang uh, ketika itu memerintah negeri Perak yang bagi dia Sultan, Sultan Iskandar Shah lah The Perak Sultan is one of the oldest monarchies in the Malay states. It was founded in 1528 upon the installation of Sultan Muzaffar Shah, the first as its first ruler. Istana Ungi Perak ni dia satu istana yang uniknya kerana dia punya kelangsungan daripada istana Melayu Melaka. Kita boleh tengok dari segi alat kebesaran, keris Taman Sari, kemudian pedang cura Simanja kini yang mana yang tu kalau kita tahu Kesultanan Melaka ni berasal daripada Sumatera, Sriwijaya, Pedang Cora Simanja kini tu ada kait dengan cita-cita Raja Suran dan sebagainya Kesultanan Melayu di Bukit Sekuntang okay? jadi benda-benda tu mewarnai Kesultanan Negeri Perak lah Kesultanan Melayu Perak ni bersamayam di sebelah kanan hmm. kan? Apabila dia orang mudik, zaman dah berubah, ada masuk apa nama, residen apa semua Itu yang berpindah Sampai ke seberang sayung Berang sayung tu ada satu makam ke kanan tu kan Masa itu istana semua belah side belah, belah kanan Kanan ni makna kanan sungai Daripada hilir, kami ni kiri Itu bila masuk residen, beralih apa semua residen Ada tercetus nak bersemayam di sebelah side kiri Itu pilihan di Bukit Candan sekarang berada lah istana tu di Bukit Candan. It was common for rulers to protect their fortresses and palaces by selecting strategic vantage locations which allowed approaching enemies to be seen from a distance. Interestingly, Sultan Yusuf Sharifuddin Muzaffar Shah, who reigned from 1886 to 1887, had his royal palace constructed by the riverbank instead. His palace was known as Istana Seri Sayo. Aside from the imminent threat of Siamese and Archinese invasion, another difficulty faced in Kuala Kangsa was the ferocity of the monsoon seasons, often causing high floods as heavy downpours flowed through the numerous tributaries along the Perak River. It is said that a severe flood had almost destroyed the Istana Seri Sayo. The 28th Sultan of Pera, Sultan Idris Murshidul Azam Shah, made the decision to relocate Kuala Kangsa's palace complex from Sayong to Bukit Chandan. His new palace was first referred to as Istana Idris, but was then renamed as Istana Negara. Upon its completion in 1897, Istana Negara bore witness to the first Durba meeting among members of the Federated Malay States Council of Rulers. In 1931, the Istana Negara was demolished to make way for a modern palace that was to be the residence of Sultan Iskandar Shah. It was named Istana Iskandaria in his honour. At the present, it serves as a primary institution for palace protocols, royal ceremonies and as the official residence of the rulers of Perak, who have all been installed ceremoniously at this palace since its completion in 1933. Tapi di negeri-negeri lain, terutamanya di negeri Perak ini, apabila tiba masa untuk membina sebuah istana, pihak kolonial, pihak British, macam biasa, dia akan mengambil reka bentuk daripada India. Daripada India. India adalah merupakan tanah jajahan British yang paling besar dan paling banyak bangunan yang dibina. Dan apa yang mereka faham tentang India itu atau tentang Islam 
banyak yang mereka pelajari daripada India lah. The architecture of Istana Iskandaria is reminiscent of Mughal-inspired design, blended with West Asian architectural elements, especially with the pointed arches, onion-shaped domes, and minarets. It is rich with hidden decorations that show Islam as a pillar and foundation for the Perak Sultanate, as well as a harmonious relationship between the Sultan and his subjects. Sebenarnya ada tergenala, okay? kalau kita lihat sejarah dia uh, pada masa itu oleh kerana uh, berlakunya uh, pergaduhan antara gajah peliharaan daripada Sultan pada masa itu. Jadi dulu-dulu Sultan-Sultan ini memang ada membela gajah lah sebenarnya. Okay? Ada membela gajah, iaitu berlaku pergaduhan gajah, antara gajah iaitu baginda Sultan yang bernama Kulut Candan, nama, uh, nama gajah itu. Dan juga dengan gajah Raja Dhilir yang bernama Kulut Gangga. The Royal Ubudiyah Mosque is located at Bukit Chandan, built by the Sultan Idris Moshidul Azam Shah in 1913 and inaugurated by Sultan Abdul Jalil Karamatullah Shah in 1917. Its name bears the meaning of to yield oneself to the will of Allah. The building is regarded as one of the most magnificent mosque designs in Malaysia and a symbol of faith among the Muslims of Perak. Its golden dome and minarets as exquisite examples of Islamic design. Okay. Masjid Ubudiyah ni terletak di Bukit Chandan, berhampiran dengan Istana Iskandariah. Dan ianya dibina uh, pada tahun uh, batu asas diletakkan uh, pada tahun 1913 dan disiap dibina pada tahun 1917 lah. Ketika itu uh, peperangan dunia pertama sedang berlaku jadi uh, Itu adalah antara faktor kenapa bahan-bahan yang sukar didapati untuk masuk ke Malaysia ya, untuk dibina menggunakan uh, marble daripada Italy dan juga uh, menjadi beberapa kekangan lah untuk binaan itu. If the old Kuala Lumpur railway station is recognised as one of the most beautiful train stations in the world, the Ubudiyah Mosque is regarded as one of the most magnificent mosques in the world, which displays the exquisiteness of Islamic design. Both of these buildings were designed by the same prolific architect, Arthur Benison Hubbock, the government architect of Federated Malay States. Dari segi architecture style pula, dia menggunakan Indo-Saracenic architecture style. Okey, ini merupakan gabungan antara beberapa architecture style termasuklah Mongol architecture style dan juga vernacular architecture style. So gabungan inilah yang dinamakan sebagai Indo-Saracenic architecture style. Secara keseluruhannya, masjid merupakan nadi. Nadi bagi penduduk, okey, nadi bagi sebuah penempatan yang melambangkan Okay, yang melambangkan Bandar Diraja. The Royal Ubudiyah Mosque underwent major renovation for the first time in 1991, where its prayer hall was extended to accommodate the increasing number of worshippers. The mandate for the Perak ruler at the time, Sultan Azlan Muhibuddin Shah, to architect Surya, was to have the original structure retained and for the new additions to complement the original design. Renovation works were completed in 1994, increasing the mosque capacity from 800 to 1400 worshippers. New praying areas were extended to the left and right side of the building's rear, harmonizing with the existing architecture design and building scale. The Malay proverb, Raja dan Rakyat Berpisah Tiada, or The King and His People Are Inseparable, symbolizes the function of the Dataran Diraja, or the Royal Square, where the Sultan would meet his subjects. The Royal Square in Kuala Kangsa, also known as Padang Kawat, is adjacent to Istana Iskandaria and the Perak River. It is custom for each Sultan to meet the public at Kuala Kangsa's Royal Square, 
after his coronation ceremony to proclaim his status as the new ruler of Pera. The Royal Square is also a popular place for leisure activities among the locals and tourists alike. Laluan protokol ni adalah laluan pertabalan. Okey, laluan selepas sultan ditabalkan, dia nak keluar berjumpa dengan rakyat. Dia selepas dia ditabalkan, dia kena pergi ke kawasan-kawasan. Okey, sebagai contoh dia pergi ke kawasan A, dia akan berjumpa dengan rakyat, dia bertanyakan masalah rakyat, dia akan berjumpa kawasan B dan sebagainya. Okey, kawasan inilah kawasan perarakan sesudah pertabalan sultan itu sendiri. Sebelum ni, dia menggunakan uh, dia menggunakan sungai. Dan pada tahun 1900 ni starting lah Jalan merupakan elemen yang terpenting lah okay, Bagi menghubungkan dari satu kawasan ke kawasan yang lain okay. Jadi bila fungsi sungai ni telah bertukar kepada jalan okay, Tempat telah bertukar okay, Fungsinya masih sama, tempat telah bertukar Jadinya laluan protokol dahulunya ada sungai Sekarang telah digantikan dengan jalan istana Inilah kawasan hutan berjalan Sultan berjumpa dengan dengan penduduk dan sebagainya lah. Ha. Inilah laluan protokol dia. Kuala Kangsar's primary arterial road is Jalan Taiping, formerly known as Main Road. The 1.57 km double carriageway is the longest road in Kuala Kangsar. The town has a protocol road that stretches from the gateway of Jalan Istana into Bukit Chandan, where a great number of historical landmarks are located, such as the Istana Iskandaria, Istana Kenangan, and the Royal Ubudiah Mosque. This protocol road is also referred to as the Coronation Path, as a procession for the Sultan's coronation ceremony would take on the same route, though in the past, the starting point would have been from the riverside. The royal palm trees and yellow ornamental street lamps that are placed along Jalan Istana or makes the road's protocol character distinct from other roads. The sense of enclosure along Jalan Istana is also contributed by its large tree lines and shades. The ratio of Jalan Istana's narrow road to the height of the old rain trees contributes to Kuala Kangsar's picturesque atmosphere. Other than a special streetscape treatment, there is not much difference between Kuala Kangsar's protocol road and the general ones. The protocol road is open for public use except during special occasions such as the coronation procession. Kita boleh tengok dari segi tiang lampu. Contoh, tiang lampu kat kawasan laluan protokol ni lain daripada tiang lampu jalan biasa. Dia sangat unik, special. Okay? Dan juga adalah elemen-elemen jalan, elemen uh, street furniture. Okay? Ada kelainan di situ. Tetapi dari segi saiz, dari segi kelebaran jalan dan sebagainya, tetap sama. Dan function asal, okay? selain daripada laluan protokol, function asal dia juga merupakan tempat hubungan menghubungkan antara satu daerah ke daerah yang lain. Okey, kalau kata tan tak menggunakan jalan tu semasa hari pertabalan dia. Galeri Sultan Azrul Shah ni diubah fungsinya menjadi sebuah galeri daripada asalnya adalah daripada sebuah istana sebenarnya dulu dipanggil istana ulu pada dibina pada tahun uh, 1903 tak salah saya ya jadi uh, pada tahun itu uh, dibina awal lagi lah siap pada tahun 1903 jadi ketika itu uh, tempat bersemayam beberapa sultan lah. uh, dan akhirnya pada tahun 2003 diubah fungsinya menjadi sebuah galeri uh, yang dinamakan sebagai Galeri Sultan Azlan Shah.
Kalau kita lihat kepada reka bentuk bangunan ini, dia dibina pada pada era uh, British, ya, era uh, kolonial. Arkitek uh, British ketika itu yang untuk bangunan ini, uh, dia mengambil reka bentuk hybrid daripada saya. Dia bercampur antara neoclassicism dengan local. Ada sedikit local element dekat situ. ya. Jadi kalau kita perhatikan uh, reka bentuk uh, galeri ini, secara mendominasinya adalah gaya reka bentuk tu didominasi oleh gaya yang dipanggil sebagai neoclassicism lah. Kuala Gangsar ni, seperti kami ni, tebing kan. Orang Melayu suka duduk tepi sungai, pasal apa? Transport. Transportation. Bahasa nak ayo, orang Melayu malas naik bukit. <laughs> Mudah je orang Melayu. Ha. Prior to the construction of today's modern road network, rivers served as a primary means of navigating land. Elephants were then used to cross over the waters. Despite the tremendous physical infrastructure developments that have taken place throughout the world, rivers remain an essential natural feature. They're still a source of food and income for many individuals. The 400 km long Perak River is the second longest river in Peninsula Malaysia. It was central to the social, economic and political realm of the Malay civilization in Perak holding the many mysteries of the socio-cultural and economic history of the local Malays which are somewhat evident from the existence of traditional villages, royal tombs and remnants of old buildings. Bandar di Raja Kuala Kansar ni berkembang dan bandar-bandar di Negeri Perak ni berkembang di tepi-tepi sungai. Kebanyakan bandar-bandar uh, di Malaysia ni, Pahang pun macam tu. Penempatan-penempatan tu tepi sungai. Sebab sungai menjadi transportation, menjadi laluan. Apabila kita bercerita pasal sungai ni sebenarnya, dia sungai ni dia lebih kepada satu jalan ataupun highway lah pada zaman dahulu. Sungai Perak ni merupakan satu-satunya sungai yang terpenting di negeri Perak itu sendiri sebab dia menghubungkan antara beberapa kawasan ataupun daerah di sepanjang ataupun di sekitar negeri Perak itu sendiri. Jadinya, hubung kaitnya pada zaman dahulu Sultan ni dia tak ada Rolls Royce. Ha, dia tak ada Mercedes. Okey, jadi apa dia dia punya Rolls Royce? Apa dia punya Mercedes? Jadi dia punya kereta dia ni adalah sungai. Kalau atas jalan darat, kenderaan dia adalah gajah. Kalau kita tengok zaman dulu, okey sungai ni dia ada jeti. Sultan ni dia nak naik ke ke, ke dia punya bahtera, kita panggil bahtera eh. Okay. Dia nak naik ke dia punya bahtera. Dia perlu ada satu platform. Ah ha, itulah jeti yang dikhaskan untuk sultan. Apabila jeti tu, okey dulunya Jalan protokol dia ada sungai. JT ni merupakan JT yang khas untuk sultan ni melakukan istiadat pertabalan, istiadat-istiadat di raja. Bila pertabalan Sultan Perak, selepas pemerintah Perak ni dia lantik, dia kena ikut program ni. Program ni dia bermula daripada makam Tok Temung yang ada kaitan, kemudian dia terus mudik ke sungai sampai ke Teluk Intan. One of Perak's royal coronation customs, the istiadat tabal menziarahi makam-makam diraja, requires the Perak Sultan and Queen to tour the Perak River on a royal boat, the Balai Gambang Cepakasari, and visit all the royal tombs along the river. Dari segi istiadat pertabalan pun, ada beberapa peringkat. Ada istiadat tabal kerajaan, tabal uh, adat, tabal pusaka, paling unik juga, menziarahi makam. Uh, macam sekarang, Sultan Perak dah ada sampai 35. Jadi, 34 makam yang kena dilawati. Itu pun sebahagian nasib baik ada yang di luar makam yang tak adalah di dalam negeri Perak. Di luar uh, yang mana tak terlibatlah dalam istiadat ni.
untuk Kesultanan Perak ada empat perkara ni yang menjadikan atau mendukungkan Kesultanan Perak tu institusi beraja kemudian dia ada institusi orang besar kemudian dia ada institusi orang besar jajahan kemudian lagi satu dia ada yang terbaru institusi orang besar jajahan dengan institusi Dewan Negara Perak ni dua penjelmaan baru hak moden punya institusi Dewan Negara jadi gabungan antara yang lama dengan yang baru ini yang mendukungkan Kesultanan Perak tu yang dapat menggerakkan Kesultanan Perak tu Dan selain daripada dua zon ni, ada uh, warisan yang terletak di luar uh, pesisir bandar diraja. Ke Sayung, kita boleh tengok makam diraja masjid lama dan uh, pembuatan uh, labu Sayung di sana, di kota lama, rumah-rumah uh, itu semua tu. Jadi masih ada lagi lah warisan-warisan bandar diraja ni. Hingga paling jauh kita boleh pergi adalah ke Temoh lah uh, yang mana ada kisah ala uh, uh, to temo dan sebagainya kan Sebelum ada ni istana di Bukit Candan, Bukit Candan dipanggil dulu dipanggil Batang Hari. Sebelum ada di istana di sana, istana di sini. Ha, kawasan gaji di sini. Tu sebab tengok makam banyak di sini. Bila ketika dahulu saya pernah dengar cerita daripada orang tu cakap produk-produk ni dipersembahkan daripada tuanku lah sultan. So mungkin di situ mungkin tuanku lebih ha, dekat dengan rakyat jelata dekat sini kan. So mungkin persembahan dipersembahkan dengan produk tu masing-masing dengan kreativiti. Ha, sebab itu ada relate itu ada satu penceritaan. Ha, penggunaan daripada tuanku sultan Labu Sayu. So kita itu memang dah ada relate mana ha, Sultan dengan ayat tu memang dekatlah masa masa ketika itu yang menghasilkan produk tu sebab produk tu boleh sampai ke ke istana kan. Uh, nama saya Mak Farid Zamri. Uh, berusia 45 tahun dan salah seorang pengusaha Labu Sayung di Kampung Kepala Bendang ni lah. Labu Sayung is a thriving traditional business that has helped sustain Perak's cultural economy. Labu Sayung and Labu Pulau Tiga are pottery handicrafts that are well known domestically and abroad. Uh, kalau dari segi sejarah dia Labu Sayung kalau kita tengok di negeri Perak mana yang mana boleh menaikkan salah satu uh, Perak dari segi produk adalah di Kuala Kansar lah. Terutama di Sayung ni boleh menghasilkan uh, Labu Sayung tu kan. Jadi kita tahu antara banyak banyak negeri di Malaysia ni yang menghasilkan produk berasaskan teraliat. Contoh di Pahang, di Kelantan, di Kedah, di Sarawak, Sabah semua menghasilkan. Tapi labu sayung yang boleh menaikkan nama Perak adalah di Kuala Kansar ni. Itulah salah satu produk, ikon produk yang boleh menaikkan salah satu negeri Perak tu. Labu sayung memang kalau kita dari pergi sejarah penghasilan dia lebih kepada kehidupan orang dulu. Untuk keperluan mereka seperti menyimpan air. Labu sayung fokus adalah produk yang menyimpan air. Jadi kemungkinan dulu memang kita tahu tak ada tak ada peti air ke apa sebab air yang simpan labu sayur memang sejuk. Mengusahakan benda tu berbeza. Dia orang buat cara pembuatan mereka tu berbeza dengan kerjasama dengan kaedah dia orang tu berbeza, semangat dia orang berbeza. One of the many successful labu sayur production centers is KZ Craft Enterprise owned by Muhammad Parib bin Zamari. This enterprise was a recipient of the 2012 Perak Tourism Award and the winner of the 2014 Ceramic Category. KZ Craft Enterprise bears the combined initials of Muhammad Pari's parents, Kamsiah and Zamari. His father, Zamari, was a Labu Sayu Master Craftsman who was awarded the UNESCO Seal of Excellence in 2002. Residential enclaves in the royal town of Kuala Kangsa can be classified into two categories the aristocratic enclave and the citizen enclave. 
In the past, the aristocratic enclave was focused around the palace at Bukit Chandan, facilitating any means of businesses between the aristocrats and the palace household. The citizen residential enclaves would have been situated along the riverbanks. Evidently, most of the older villages such as Kota Lamakiri, Kota Lamakanan, and Sayong are found along the Perak River. Kalau kita lihat dari segi penempatan, okay, karakter penempatan ni, okay, di, di dalam bandar diraja, penempatan ni terbagi pada dua. Okay, dia ada penempatan dari segi untuk golongan-golongan bangsawan dan juga penempatan bagi golongan rakyat biasa. Kebanyakannya, okay, golongan penempatan golongan bangsawan ni terletak di sekitar istana. Okay, sebabnya kalau Sultan nak berhubung, Sultan nak panggil untuk ada sebarang-sebarang isu dan sebagainya, dia terletak berdekatan. Untuk penempatan untuk rakyat biasa ni, dia kebanyakan dia, dia terletak di sebelah highway. Highway zaman dulu adalah sungai. Sebab tu kita tengok kebanyakan penempatannya adalah di sepanjang sungai. Termasuklah uh, kota lama kiri, kota lama kanan, penempatan sayung dan sebagainya. Okey, memang terletak di sungai. Sebab itu adalah main road. Itu adalah jalan utama pada zaman dahulu. The royal town of Kuala Kangsa displays a rich legacy of buildings with significant architectural and historical values. Its palaces, administrative buildings, mosques, traditional Malay houses, and monuments serve as landmarks to reflect its urban identity and sense of place. Such heritage assets are key to the growth of Kuala Kangsa today. The Pavilion Tower is one of the finest structures in Kuala Kangsa. Located on Jalan Bendahara, it was built in 1920 during the reign of Sultan Iskandar Shah, the 30th Sultan of Perak. The architect responsible for its successful construction was N. E. Don B. C. D. The three-storey structure was built facing a spacious field to function as a polo pavilion where spectators from among the government officials and royal household would enjoy polo matches or military ceremonies. Today, the structure has now been incorporated as part of the Medan Pavilion Public Park. The pavilion tower is a hybrid design of Western and local architecture. Corinthian columns, for example, are combined with balustrades and fascia boards of Malay motifs. Just across the road is the Malay College of Kuala Kangsa, or MCKK, established in 1905 as the first full residential school in the country on the recommendation of Richard James Wilkinson, the education officer at the time. MCKK was initially opened to the sons of Malay aristocrats to educate and prepare them for administrative positions in the Federated Malay States. For a period of time, it was dubbed the Eton of the East in reference to a well-known elite school in England. Admission was only open to non-aristocrats in 1955. MCKK has produced a number of national leaders, especially in the years leading up to Malaysia's independence. Among them, Tun Haji Abdul Razak, the second Prime Minister of Malaysia. Raja Tun Uda, Selangor's Chief Minister. And Tan Sri Ni Ahmad Kamil, Chief Minister of Kelantan. Jika kita nak sebut tentang bangunan warisan, uh, suka saya nak highlightkan uh, warisan tu merangkumi semua benda yang lama. Tapi bukan semua benda lama adalah warisan. Kita dah ada akta warisan uh, kebangsaan ataupun akta warisan negara lah. Sebarang bangunan warisan, kita boleh rujuk kriteria yang ada dalam akta tersebut untuk menjadikan sesuatu bangunan itu adalah bangunan warisan dia mesti ada nilai sejagat ataupun nilai setempat dia impact kepada masyarakat dan negara lah dia bukanlah kadang bangunan lama je warisan tak kita kena tengok apa ciri-ciri kriteria yang boleh menyebabkan dia dianggap sebagai bangunan warisan mungkin dari segi sejarahnya ataupun dari segi seni benanya uh, itu antara benda yang selalu jadi kayu pengukur lah pada sesuatu bangunan warisan. 
Baitul Rahma at Bukit Chandan was a mansion resided by a member of the noble Perak royal family. Its architecture differs from other traditional Malay houses in Kuala Kansar in terms of its spatial layout and architectural detailing. Baitul Rahma was built in 1911 under the instruction of Raja Kecil Sulung Harun Al Rashid as a gift for his first wife, Che Rahma. The house is extensively decorated with Malay carvings due to his deep interest in the art. The Baitul Rahma is dual symmetry in form. It features twin portico, which is a variant of the Malay Anjung. The portico unites the roof finials and ornamental panels with the columnar nature of the structure, which is decorated with wood carving motifs inspired by honeybees. The wooden capitals of the columns are further decorated with carvings. Baitul An-Nur is located not far from the Royal Ubudiyah Mosque. It was constructed by Tukang Sufyan, a master craftsman under the instructions of Raja Kecil Sulung Harun al-Rashid. The house was intended for Raja Harun al-Rashid's third wife, Raja Mantra. Baitul Anur was named after their eldest son, Raja Anur Shah. The overall design of Baitul Anur is a mixture of Malay and Western architecture with an essence of a royal palace. The spaces incorporated into the building consist of an audience hall, a common feature found in Malay palaces, though at a smaller scale. The original structure was built in 1912 with a layout that consisted of a veranda, four bedrooms and a kitchen on the first floor. A hall and a grand staircase was placed on the ground floor. As Raja Mantra's family grew, the house was also extended. Additional rooms were added and the window at his son's bedroom extension can be linked directly to the rooftop, with balconies on the right and the left of its surambi. At this time, the grand staircase was still intact and was linked to a rooftop balcony, the Soto. Baitul Anur was different from the common traditional Malay houses in Perak. The grand staircase had a regal scale due to the high ceiling of the lower level. The illusion of height also comes from the shape of its white platform, which narrows towards the top. The grand staircase mentioned is no longer standing. What is left is its bottom platform, where Rajamantra's family would have entertained themselves with evening tea. The original door, which linked to the grand staircase, is now a full height window. The building Soto, which served as an observation platform to enjoy the surrounding view, has also been demolished. It was constructed on a platform with a wrought iron staircase. The load was supported by a timber structure, which was challenging to maintain. At the side of the Royal Budya Mosque, behind Baitul Anwar, is the beautiful Rumah Mio. The traditional wooden house is well maintained until today. It was once owned by a clerk, Tun Ismail bin Ahmad, who worked for the 30th Sultan Perak, Sultan Iskandar Shah. The house was then purchased by Toh Muda Haji Mio Samsudin. He was one of those who compiled the book Hulu Perak Dalam Sejarah. Currently, Toh Muda Haji Mio Samsudin's family members are still staying in this house. Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Raja Perempuan Kelsum is an all-girls secondary school. In the early 1870s, the school site was known to be Bukit Chemida, where Chemida's house was located. Chemida, or Long Hamida, was a wealthy and well-connected aristocrat. She was coincidentally the sister-in-law to Long Jabfa, a pioneer tin miner in Perak. Jemida's land was purchased by the British administration to build a house for the High Commissioner of Perak. Though the first Perak British resident, J.G. Davidson, 
left the position before the residency was completed. The residency was occupied by his successors, such as Sir Hugh Lowe, Ernest Woodford Birch, and Sir Reginald George Watson. The first residency building was demolished and rebuilt according to the design of Arthur Benison Hubbock in 1906. It was then known as the King's Pavilion, where legislative council meetings were held. On the top floor of the main building is a tower with a view of the entire town of Kuala Kang Sa. The King's Pavilion was turned into a school in 1960, housing what is today known as SMK Raja Perempuan Kelsung. The name of the school commemorates the mother of Sultan Idris Iskandar Shah. According to Anthony Burgess, in his book Little Wilson and Big God, the British residents of Pera were reluctant to live at the residency, as many felt a certain spiritual presence. Sekolah Menengah Kebangsaan Clifford is a national all-boys secondary school established in 1897, initially known as Government English School. It is one of the oldest exclusive boys' school in the country. When its main block was erected in 1927, the school was renamed as Clifford School after the then Governor of Straits Settlements, Sir Hugh Charles Clifford. The school was used as a Japanese military base during the Japanese occupation from 1942 to 1945. Headmaster Mr. Arumukam worked closely with his team of teachers to build up Clifford School after the war. The Istana Gahara on Jalan Raja Idris is a stately old mansion which had seen better days, it was the home of the last Raja Bandahara, Raja Abdul Rashid, until his death in 1953. It became derelict when it was abandoned in the 1980s. It has intricate carvings along its roof eaves and can be returned to its former glory with thoughtful restoration. Along Jalan Bendahara is a small wooden Anglican church building, the Church of Resurrection. Built in 1908, it is able to accommodate up to 50 worshippers. The church was consecrated by the Bishop of Singapore in 1910. Plaques hanging in the church honour Kuala Kangsa's early Christian community members, including a soldier who died in 1915 Singapore mutiny and Marines who lost their lives during the Malayan Emergency. This well-preserved church is managed by the Anglican Diocese of West Malaysia. Victoria Bridge, a single-track railroad truss bridge located in Karai, was constructed by the Perak Government Railways between December 1897 and March 1900 to link Sungai Siput and Kuala Kangsa. Designed by engineer G. W. Fryer, it is one of the nation's oldest railway bridges. This bridge was officiated by Sultan Idris Moshidul Azam Shah. The Victoria Bridge remained in operation until 2002, when a large concrete girder bridge was constructed parallel to the old bridge to handle rail traffic. There are two ciri keunikan dia. Uh, pertama adalah dari segi nilai sejarah dia, uh, seni bina dia. Kita boleh tengoklah seni bina dia yang unik dan kita boleh tahu antara jambatan yang tertua dan terpanjang di negara kita lah. Bukan saja uh, jadi warisan uh, tapi dia juga jadi tarikan pelanjungan lah kerana dia punya keunikan seni bina dia tu lah. Selepas dia tak digunakan sehingga tahun 2014 antara period tempoh masa tersebut jambatan tu agak terbiar tetapi selepas tu ada pihak uh, selepas 
uh, NGO berusaha untuk uh, uh, memelihara, membersihkan naikkan dia sebagai tarikan pelancongan benda tu pelan-pelan dapat diangkat sebagai bangunan warisan lah Kuala Kangsa is well known for its local eateries and traditional handicrafts primarily the tekat, keris and labu sayung The commercial heart of the town is made up of two or three roads that are aligned with old shop houses. Its alleys are often busy with street store activities, the sale of handicrafts, souvenirs and fresh food. The Pasar Besar is the oldest market in Kuala Kangsa, always bustling with its commercial activities. Many from areas outside of Kuala Kangsa district would travel to sell their products here. Down at the riverfront is a jetty from where visitors could take a short boat cruise to cross the Perak River to the Sayong Crafts Complex. Okay, Kuala Kangsa saya nampak berpotensi besar lah untuk menjadi sebuah pusat warisan ya, eh, pelancongan ya, eh, yang berasaskan warisan ya eh, dengan title atau dengan jenama yang dibawanya sebagai bandar diraja. Saya nampak daripada sudut bangunan-bangunan daripada sudut seni bina yang ada dia represent eh, daripada gulungan-gulungan eh, rumah-rumah kampung kepada rumah-rumah pembesar-pembesar kepada rumah-rumah bangsawan sehingga kepada istana. Semua uh, kategori seni bina ini ada di Kuala Kansa. Dia sebenarnya kita kena lahirkan satu mentor. Bila kita lahirkan satu mentor, orang yang hebat, orang pengusaha yang hebat, orang akan ikut. Macam mana cara dia, macam tu lah cik pergi ke Ina Craft tu kan, uh, Mohamed tu. Dia seorang hebat, boleh sebagai adik guru, bukan dia berkongsi apa ni. Macam mana dia boleh jadi hebat tu? Itu orang nak tahu. Kan? Kongsi dari segi pembuatan tu mungkin orang boleh belajar, kita buat kelas, kita belajar. Tapi kongsi dari segi uh, inspirasi dia macam mana dia boleh kekal, dia, dia boleh bertahan, dia boleh kejayaan lalu yang cabaran-cabaran dia kan? Ha, itu yang dapat dikongsikan itulah yang terbaik semua. Architecture is the future of archaeology. The architectural environment reflects the culture of the civilization it represents. It expresses life, encompassing spiritual, physical, emotional, taste, philosophy, and religion. It is one of the key components that distinguishes any community. Conservation of heritage sites is essential as a reference for the future generations.